welcome. Thank you. First of all, what would happen if you would go to the other uh, festival venues and a black guy approaches you and asks you for the time? Will you get your phone? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, for me, I would probably react in the same way if it was a white boy or white man ask me or white girl or whatever um, I will be um, paying attention if this is a rhetorical trap so but um, yeah I'm aware of the rhetorical trap now so so they they can't do it on me uh, <laughs> how would you know well I, um, well, uh, actually, they are using it in a very skillful way in the film. I mean, the, the boys that were doing the robbery, they, they created this rhetorical trap by creating a problem that doth doesn't exist. And they were really skillful in looking out boys that were really young in, in the center of uh, Göteborg, where I live. And they woke up to those guys and they asked, excuse me, what time, do you know what time it is? And when they get to see the cell phone, they create a problem that doesn't exist and say that this cell phone might belong to my kid brother. And to solve the situation, we have to go and show it to him. And he can say if it's his or not. And this is actually a very old uh, trick. I have read about it in novels from the 1800s. And, and if you look at when uh, the US went into Iraq, they used the same kind of rhetorical uh, thing. We, they said that we want to look if you have nuclear weapons. So they create one problem to do something else. Um, yeah. <laughs> but would, would you have known that before you saw the clipping which you, which on which your film was based? Well, I guess that, um, I mean, the robbers used it on boys that were in the same age as themselves, mm. so they were between 12 and 14 years old. And, and um, I don't think as an adult that I would go for it. But I heard that, that tourists that are in, in other parts of the world are, are tricked in, in different kind of ways, um, like creating like a s uh, something that is um, connected to the cultural in, in the country that you are visiting. So, uh, so there are different kinds of this, uh, of course, that I think that I would be uh, in the trap of. Mm. <laughs> Your film premiered in, in Cannes, yeah. and since then it's been called Bold, and very mm. brave, a mm. very brave thing to, uh, to show. It's also been called Racist. Mm. Um, did that bother you? Uh, well, in the beginning, I mean, the film started out from a newspaper article, from a local newspaper in Göteborg, and uh, uh, I say it's inspired of those events, and one of the things that I was inspired of was an image in this newspaper, and it was five black boys robbing three white boys. And I immediately could uh, tell that this image is controversial and it's provoking, and it started a lot of questions in me. And um, I think I got interested in this project because when I made an interview with one of the robbers, he told me that even though they were only 12 years old, they were in a very aware way playing on the stereotypic image of the black man that exists in our society. So they were using this stereotypic image and victimized image uh, to create an unoutspoken threatening when, when they fulfilled the robberies. And for me, this was the point when I uh, realized that it's very important that the boys are black uh, uh, because I wanted to highlight that, that in that young age, you're all ready to start to play on those fictionalized, stereotypic uh, images. It's, it's very interesting and it's very alarming. So hmm. yeah. But is it, do you understand uh, that people see your film as racist? Well, uh, if you look at on it as a on the surface, and if you don't look at it in a nuanced way, uh, well, then you can, then existence can be whatever you want it to be. So, if, but if you are looking at this existence in a nuanced way and the on, on under the surface, well, where do you end up? With in it's, it's because of the audience ideological standpoint, I believe. So in which way do you read things going on in society? In which way are you looking at actions like this? And um, the goal for me with the film is, of course, to confront the audience with their thoughts and beliefs on, on, on those images. And why, why is this image so controversial? And we have to ask us this question. Because I believe in, in Sweden, where I live, uh, the subject of play or questions like this, uh, we are so afraid at looking at them. So we're looking in another direction. And that's just a way of keeping the problem the way it is. 
And for me, it's, it's not about immigrants, it's about skin color. Because I, I consider the boys Swedish. But there are five black Swedish boys <laughs> and there are uh, three white. And I mean, they're, they're, they're n that's not very nuanced to say like that because they have different skin colors uh, inside each of the groups also. But um, so I um, thought that the provocation was important in this case. Because we had need to look at this topic or those things, those actions in society from as many s possible perspectives there is. Uh, because nowadays people are so afraid to get close to the subject because you're afraid to say the wrong word and use the wrong word. And you're afraid to be accused of being racist. But if you look on what racism is, is when you put w one race above another one and say that you are superior. But for me, this is a lot more about fear of foreigners. It's about group behavior. That human beings have, we tend to uh, be afraid of a group that we don't feel connected to. And we are less afraid of a group that we are connected to. So if there's someone that I share the same attributes and the same clothes, and I can see that we are from the same uh, part of society, I'm less afraid of that person than I am from a person I see. Wi maybe he comes from a poor uh, part of the town. Uh, he has a different skin color than me. Um, so I'm, I, I was really interested in focusing on those things from a behavioristic way of looking at it. Uh, because it, when, when I grew up, I grew up on an island outside Göteborg. And uh, that island was called Styrsjö. And the next, the neighbor island was called Donsö. And I was, of course, more afraid of the boys from Donsö than I was from the other boys from Styrsjö. <laughs> so it's, it's as simple as that. And, and um, um, to, to really get a grip on all those questions on this area that we have such a problem getting close to, we have to look at it from this perspective. And we also have to look at it without pointing fingers at other people and saying you are a racist or you are, uh, mm, uh, yeah, you are, you, are, you are treating something uh, in a bad way. Uh, because I think that we have to like, we have to look at it in under a very, very bright lamp. We have to like really investigate it. And then there's, there's a better, mm, better position to actually take care of, of, of the problems. One of the things I thought was quite interesting about your film is um, it sh also shows that a society that is scared on one hand and tries to be tolerant on the other hand yeah. actually almost evokes events like this. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the characters that I think is really important in the film is the, the woman in the end that are walking up to the fathers. And she is, is behaving in a well-willing way, but she's also, uh, <laughs> uh, she's also saying things that is built on prejudice. She is acting in a prejudice way. She says, I see two men standing over a little black boy, and, and the man goes, what, what does it have that this boy is black? I can choose who robs my kids. And she's reading in things in this boy's skin color and making him a victim even though she don't know anything about his background. And this is also a way of keeping the balance as it is in society. Um, and one of the things that I think is the most provoking thing about play is that we are so used to see white people in control of black people. Uh, and in, in play, I turn this thing upside down. So this time it's the white people that are the victims and, and the black, black people are in majority and they are controlling the situation. They are on, in the power. And, and swifting those victimized and power roles um, gets us confused and we don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. A big part of the confusion comes from uh, the fact that there are rules, but these kids don't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. it's, it's plain and simple. And, and as a society, we can't handle it if the rules aren't followed. Well, um, yeah, in, in a way, I mean, I, the, the, the robbers come from this, this part of the town and the victims come from this part of the town. And uh, Göteborg is, as any other European city, very segregated. So the people with the resources and high education, they live in this part of the town. And the low educated and the people without resources live in this part of the town. So they can create uh, thoughts about each other. And, and uh, the prejudice is as big in this part as in this part. So the robbers have prejudice about the victims and vice versa, of course. Um, and 
I mean, there are some rules that they are um, holding on to. And the rules are like, well, if you show me your cell phone, you have to suit yourself. If you show your cell phone to me, then you, of course I will rob you. And it's like, it's like stand letting the bike stand outside here without the lock on it. You have to suit yourself. So there are rules, uh, even in, in the kids' world. And, but one of the feelings that I got when I read through the trial documents was that the kids' world and the, the adults' world were taking place in two parallel different layers. So adults had a really hard time to uh, actually do something, even though they saw something is wrong here. And kids had a really hard time to asking an uh, adult for help. And uh, so, so, so the kids' world is like a, um, uh, the, the law of a young girl, actually. So, so the rules in the adult world, it doesn't exist there. And I was told something by a friend of mine. He is 70 years old. And he told me when he was six years old, he had, uh, his parent put an address tag around his neck and let him out on the street to play. And at that time, you saw other adults as someone who could help your children. So if, if they were in a, in a bad situation, an adult would help them to get home. But today we see other adults as something, someone who are threatening our children. And of course, this attitude makes those parallel worlds even more separated and makes it harder for an adult today to actually say something to another kid that I see, he's not behaving or she's not behaving. You shouldn't do like that. We are not allowed to do this anymore. So we are losing trust in what we have in common. Um, and there is a very interesting example of this if you look at Göteborg as a town, because in one part of the town, they have created a gated community. And a gated community is when you have a gate and uh, we are taking responsibility what's inside of this gate. And in the other part of town, they have um, groups of people that call themselves mafia. And they have their own rules, they declare. So th both of this way is to say we don't take responsibility on what's in between in the public spaces. What is it about group behavior that interests you that much? Because it's, it's also a part of your film, Involuntary. Yes, um, I think that it's one of the most fundamental thing about being a human being, that we are group animals. And um, um, I think that um, we are limited um, uh, and affected by the group in a much larger scale than we uh, admit to ourselves. And um, I, I really like to look at those topics from a behavior uh, behavioristic uh, point of view. Yeah. But why? Uh, what is it about group behavior that is? But I mean, most filmmakers have it, um, uh, make films about individual psychological, mm. and mm. you choose behavior. Different. Well, because I think that I, I th an, an interesting approach when it comes to um, to making films or investigating the things that are happening in the scenes are that. I want to be able to put myself in any of the positions of the characters in this film. And if the uh, conditions were the same, I would act in the same way. So for an example, in the cafeteria, when the boys are going in and asking for help, I could read in the trial documents that the, the, the people working in the cafeteria didn't call the police. And I was thinking, how, how could they do this? Uh, what kind of uh, persons are the, this, this, uh, the when wor working here? But so my goal when I try to investigate that scene is to create the same situation where I'm able to act in the same way. So instead of um, describing what's happening, like the, the person work, working in the cafe cafeteria is an idiot, I have to, okay, find the right circumstances for this to happen. And when I tried it, it, it became very obvious how it's possible. I mean, if I'm standing and working inside a cafeteria, and then there's a 12-year-old boy coming in to me and ask me, can you call the police? And I go, well, why? Because there's a couple of boys following us. Uh, well, where are, where are they? Th well, they're probably on the outside. Okay, are you sure they're still there? Uh, no. So okay, well, go and have a look. And if they are, they come, come in and, s and tell me again. So they go out and they come back and they say, well, they're still there. Well, but what have they done? I mean, calling the police is quite a uh, big thing to do. Well, they have been shouting at us and one of them kicked the ball at us when we are, were in the sports store. 
Well, I, okay, I can understand that it feels a little bit scary, but uh, we don't call the police if, we, if things like that happen. But you can be inside here if you want to. So, and suddenly it, it, it I could realize how you could behave in this way. And if I look at it from a behavioristic perspective, then I don't try to uh, explain individuals out from psychological uh, terms. So instead I have to look at it in, in, a, in a more generous and, and a forgiving way, I think. You, know. you also, you film very um, like an observant. You, you, um, you're a voyeur of what happens. Mm. Um, and you don't really criticize um, uh, the mm. persons in the film. Mm. At least that's what I thought, because I, I began to doubt that. Mm -hmm. Do you think you um, have an opinion about the people? In and the, the way they yes, act? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, and uh, I see the, the robbers as the, as the perpetrators and I see the, the victims as the victims. And I, I don't take a, take a standpoint for the actions of the robbers, but I, I think I take a standpoint for all the boys in the film. Uh, and there's something different about that. And, but as I said, uh, I have a really hard time to put actions in a film where I cannot relate to them at all. I have, they have to be possible for me. Uh, and I think the circumstances for things to happen um, are a lot depending on how we are placed to towards each other and, and uh, what I'm uh, about to do in a, in a certain uh, uh, second of time and so on. So I think that you can change quite many aspects to make almost everybody act in a certain way. But you also use, for example, humor to um, to show prejudices. Yeah. Mm. That is. Why do you do that? Is that? Well, th because I think there was a lot of humor in those situations, mm. uh, and uh, um, well, I think that humor is present in existence all of the time, and and I, I, I those scenes that I like most is where they are humorous in one second, and the next second they are horrifying. And uh, it's very interesting to see the audience confronted with a scene like this because are you, do you dare to laugh? Or do you, you don't know if you uh, are allowed to laugh uh, because almost every other time when we are watching something, we are told that now it's supposed that you are, you're supposed to laugh now. Mm. <laughs> and now the, the, the audience have to confront their own reactions by themselves. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. Um, you you um, mentioned that you did a lot of research. Was it very hard to um, to gain access to this group of perpetrators and victims? And uh, no, it was not very hard. I mean, I contacted the police and um, um, I was doing interviews with both victims and perpetrators. And and uh, it was quite obvious that both of them wanted to tell the story and in as uh, a positive way for themselves as as possible. Um, but no, no, it wasn't hard. Your film is called Play, mm. um, and I was wondering, is, is what they do, is it a, is it a game? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, one thing that I got to know when I read through the trial documents was that um, they didn't get, get a lot of money when they did this kind of robbery. So they could like buy a pizza afterwards or do something like that, and then the mo money was, uh, they ran out of money. And so, of course, they had to do it for some other reason. And I think of they could enjoy of controlling this, this kind of role play. Um, so, yeah, of course, it, it's a it's game. You work with a group of non-actors. Mm. Um, those are boys hitting puberty. How, how is it to work with a group like that? Did you control the group as a whole? If I did you control as a director the group? Was it hard to control? Yes, them? it was really hard because it was eight of them and it was like having half of a class. Uh, and uh, since they are in almost every every frame, they are all of eight of them, and they have to stay focused even though they don't have a lot to do. Uh, and they are quite long scenes that are very very um, well choreographed. So it was, uh, we were like repeating a scene over and over and over again. And one, some of the scenes we took for three days, we were shooting the same scene. So for example, the scene on, in the tram, we started in day one and I say to them, okay, in the end of day three, you all have to reach the maximum level of your performance. 
And then we are starting to repeat and repeat and repeat over and over again. And when we are approaching the end of day three, and I say, okay, we have five takes left, then everybody is super focused. And we have built up this kind of uh, intense feeling. And, and um, uh, of course, they don't want to shoot this tomorrow as well. So um, I think it's a good way of building up the tension and building up um, a kind of good pressure uh, when everybody wants to perform uh, almost like an important football game. And when they managed to pull off a, a quite hard scene like this, they, they were also very happy, like almost they have scored in a football game. So um, to work with young actors like that, for me, was a lot of like building up something and uh, yeah, demanding them to focus, but also give them uh, a feeling of being totally secure. Uh, I think that's one of the most important thing with directing, to make all the actors not afraid at all, not, not tensed at all just uh, re relying on the situation. Don't be afraid to do something that is wrong. If you do something different, this take it from the other, then we just, okay, we take it off in the next, next, next take. And I build up the attitude that they can't do anything that is wrong. Uh, and I uh, taking the full responsibility that you will perform in a good way. So, um, yeah, I want them to be as calm as possible. And if you work with a group like that, is it, are you just directing or are you also studying the behavior in the group? No, I actually there were some other people that were wor working with the kids as soon as they were offset. So I don't, I never actually get to get friend with the actors. Even though I'm working with the adult actors, I never get friend with them. I'm just sitting behind the, the monitor and waiting for them to get on set. And then we are working with the scene and then someone else will take care of them. Um, but there was one thing that I was very surprised of, and it was that, I mean, those boys, um, they, they come from different parts of Göteborg. And um, um, I mean, it's like that, that the, the, the black boys, they come from one part of Göteborg, except from Kevin, one of the, the, the leader personality in the group. He actually comes from the, the wealthiest family of all of them. But the other one comes from another part of Göteborg. And I thought that it would be some kind of uh, tension because of this, that they were from different parts of the society. But it turned out to be no tension at all. And of course, when we are making a film together, we have a project, we are working towards a goal together, and then all the other conflicts are put to, to side. It's, it's almost like playing in the same football team. And, and that was a beautiful thing to, to realize. It's very interesting. Do we have any questions here? Did you want to portray street culture? Because I saw so many different uh, aspects of street culture in it. Mm. It's like a study of street culture. Did you, did you want to show this to the people or was it just the robberies and, and, and the, the, the backgrounds that you wanted to show? No, but as it's in those cases automatically, I think. Uh, and what I were very interested in, in, in which way kids try to adapt to a center of a, of a town. I mean, they go to, like the, uh, to the city mall, and, and there you meet people from all of the parts of, of the town. And um, I can relate to the feeling you had when you were a kid and went into town for the first or the second time. You were like totally aware of everything happening around you. And you were uh, immediately when you were feeling threatened, then you, you, were, you were almost paralyzed. You didn't know how to handle the situation at all. And if you like, look at the robbers, I mean, they, they come from a part of the town where, where, where this kind of behavior is more present than, than from the like, middle class and well-educated kids. Uh, so they actually know how to behave when something like this happens. If something like this happens, then you should scream and yell and make, a, make it embarrassing for, for everybody that is, is close to you. But, but like the, the, the middle class kids that come from this part of town, they, oh, they, they, they have never thought uh, this from their parents, that they should scream out. Or I have to, I'm sorry, I have to wrap it up now. Thank you so much for listening and coming. Uh, you can talk to Ruben afterwards. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.